Well, this is a definite pleasure because I think the Brave Words world really embraces um, your world big time. And hey, we're here to talk about the Rock Plast beautiful concert that you've released in Germany. And I've got a lot of connections in Germany, but it's um, you brought Southern Rock to Germany in the early 80s. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we toured Europe a bunch of times and uh, always had a great, great, great uh, response uh, from Paris to Frankfurt to München to uh, Nuremberg, Stuttgart, and then into Holland. And uh, it, it was wonderful going there and seeing the response uh, from the Europeans. Uh, uh, as we know, the Europeans uh, traditionally for decades upon decades have always been extremely fond of American roots music. And of course, Southern rock is American roots music. And yeah, of uh, course. <laughs> uh, so uh, just, just like they weren't so into the pop genre. But uh, anything roots from jazz to blues to Southern rock to uh, uh, to whatever that was, uh, to Americana, uh, to bluegrass, to jug band, to whatever, they just seem to consume it and just love it. Mm -hmm. Well, I must say that um, Brave Words, we're, we're based in Canada, we're worldwide, but we've, we've made a, a ton of partnerships with the Germans, the German festivals, the labels, you name it. So when I watched that that classic video, it kind of, it's like given the climate right now, kind of broke my heart because we've been to Vauk in 20 years in a row. We've been to Summer Breeze. We have all these great partnerships and this past summer, we couldn't do anything. I know. I was supposed to be on the road there right, this past summer. Uh, with my new project, Lone Wolf, Freddie Salem and Lone Wolf. And it, it broke my heart. It, it just broke my heart not to be on some of those festivals and some of the clubs. Uh, this has been a complete catastrophic experience for the entertainment business, the bands, the musicians, and all other industries as well. Forget about that. Uh, but um, anyways, I know, I know, and I'm, uh, uh, hopefully this will all open up. We'll be back in Europe again <laughs> by summer or so. Knock on wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely knock on wood. Let's 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 be positive and focus on the actual release because it's like the Southern Rock family. It's like the metal family. There's family everywhere. And when you invaded Germany in that that time for the first time. Tell me about the yeah. memories. Tell me about the acceptance, because whenever I walk on that soil, I just feel it's a different vibe. And not to diss North America, but when I first got off a plane, I'm like, wow, there's a ton of passion here. People that are just like waving that flag of whatever you want all the time. Well, I'm going to tell you, that was a special, special show for us because our dear friends, uh, that toured with us in the States and supported us in the States, Thin Lizzy was on the show. And uh, we just got along famously with them. And the British bands and uh, European bands seemed to, all the ones that toured with us from in the States, from UFO to Michael Shanker Group to uh, Thin Lizzy, on and on, uh, we're just enamored by the whole deal, uh, the uh, Southern Rock deal. Uh, all of them, we were once visited uh, backstage at Giant Stadium uh, on a festival date uh, by Bon Scott. And uh, Bon Scott sat with me and we had uh, a bottle of Crown Royal between the two of us. It didn't last too long. But uh, he, uh, he told me that he wanted to do a Southern Rock album. And um, our whole set, he stood on the side of the stage. Another big fan of ours was Lemmy from Motorhead. And uh, we were on a show with uh, Ozzy and Motorhead and the Outlaws. We were sandwiched in the middle of those two. And uh, he was another big fan, and rightfully so. Out comes the 
Aces of Spades album, and the cover on there was Bandoleros, Outlaws, if you can recall that album cover, uh, uh, dressed in leather and chaps and spurs. It was the greatest album cover. Anyways, uh, can, can, I pause, some... can I pause you? Because it is like, this is so crazy. Because yeah. right now it's the 40th anniversary of Ace of Spades. And yes, that cover is iconic. And it right. looks like they shot it from some goddamn spaghetti Western with Clint Eastwood. And meanwhile, it was somewhere in England. But yes, so that was yeah. your influence, possibly. I, that's what, I'm <laughs> pretty sure that's what he, oh he just God. loved. I, I mean, they all just, uh, they loved us and they loved the the whole genre, the whole thing. And the outlaws especially loved the, loved the name, the whole package and the, the dual guitars, so on and so forth. And uh, whenever I would run into him uh, uh, in Los Angeles here uh, at the Rainbow or whatever, we'd always have a cordial time, a, a wonderful visiting with him. But yeah, we're a major, uh, major influence on that cover is what he told me. And uh, Huey and I first saw that cover, uh, Huey Thomason, uh, um, the wonder, wonder kid of the Outlaws. Uh, we saw the cover at a radio station in Long Island. We were doing an interview and we looked at it and we freaked out. He goes, oh, what a great, great cover that is. And uh, so it went from there. But anyways, um, yeah, it was all, uh, you know, I forget what we were talking about originally. Uh, was it, was it, uh, I, we went off on a tangent and then you got excited about the Motorhead cover. Yeah, so it's, it's all good. We can keep flowing. Okay. Yeah, good. But uh, anyways, yeah, it was always a good trip uh, over there. And we're glad to see Thin Lizzy. And the venue uh, was tremendous. I don't know if you've ever been there since you, Guys have covered the, uh, you know, the German festivals and that, but it's about an hour and a half outside of Frankfurt. And you drive from Frankfurt, uh, we were in the Minzerbubs, the buses, and drove through the Rhine Valley. Gorgeous, gorgeous villages throughout the drive, just, uh, and the Rhine Valley's to your left, and the villages to the right, and the the banks on the other side of the river with the medieval castles dotting the, dotting the bank of the river. And you get to Lorelei, which was a natural amphitheater, which held about 18,000, I guess. And that whole amphitheater overlooked the Rhine Valley. And uh, we drove in and got there. We rehearsed the night before in Frankfurt, drove in, and greeting us at uh, when the buses pulled up were Phil Lynott and Scotty Gorham uh, from uh, Thin Lizzy. And they'd been on tour with us the year before in the States, uh, Cape Cod Coliseum, Memorial Day, and a few other dates up there, New Haven, so on and so forth. So anyways, the whole day was a magical experience for us. And uh, the, the crowd was ready to go and flags were flying everywhere. And uh, keep in mind, that throughout Germany, there's a tremendous amount of U.S. servicemen that are based there. And that was probably one third of the crowd. In fact, all of our German shows, it was probably one third of the crowd uh, whenever we played Germany. So uh, everybody meshed well and it was an exciting uh, uh, time. MIG SVP Steamhammer is the company who I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, in Germany that uh, Manfred Schultz and uh, Bernd Ramian, they're the ones who contacted me to put this out. Okay. Uh, Outlaws Live in Rock Palace. And uh, it took me a year to pull together the remaining members, which, <laughs> which was only one. Uh, Huey and Billy had passed. Uh, Billy in 1995 uh, and uh, Huey uh, 13 years ago. So uh, I wish they were still around to, uh, you know, share, share in the whole thing, but uh, it is what it is. But uh, uh, it was remastered, redigitized the, uh, the visual, and uh, there's hiccups, but there's some pretty good moments too in the thing, so.
And, it's not homogenized by any means. And this was your first time in Germany, I'm told. And it's I, I'm guessing it was on the success of the Ghost Riders record that you actually could kind of play a lot more countries around the planet. Right. Right, right, right. Well, it was that, definitely, yeah. Uh, Ghost Riders was, was a big album for us, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what else, aside from Germany, did that bring to the Outlaws? Well, um, it, it was a pretty big album worldwide. And well, in fact, we have a, I don't know if you know this, but we have a Canadian gold album for Ghost Riders. Well, remember, when you, and I showed you this, dude, I was 12 when I bought this, 12 years old. Wow. Like this oh. is original. This, I didn't buy this at like some pawn shop yesterday. This is original. And I'm just, I'm just like, like pinching myself going, wow, I get to talk to this guy. <laughs> yeah, we, well, we did love us in Canada too. I think we played the Stampede one year in, uh, in Calgary and the, uh, we played Vancouver a couple times. One time when we were on the the blackout tour, do you know what the blackout tour was? Please tell me. It was, it was Black Sabbath, Ronnie James Dio uh, version with Vinnie Apice on drums, okay. and of course Geezer and Tony, and uh, it was the Outlaws, and we did about thirty dates nationwide, uh, all major coliseums, and. Uh, uh, it, it worked out. I mean, it, it worked out. I mean, at that point, the outlaws we we turned harder, harder, more aggressive, louder, so on and so forth. So, uh, but we played Vancouver uh, and somewhere else uh, uh, in outside of Vancouver. I'll, I'll think of it during the conversation. But well, uh, you, you kind of lead me to my next question because, and not that I ever questioned this, we, we like, I rever the whole Southern rock thing. And um, whenever Brave Words reports on anything from the Southern rock community, whether it be the Outlaws or Skinner or the Allen Brothers, and when I'm watching that show, the Rock Palace show, I'm like, wow, this is dark, this is mean, this is aggressive, and this is loud. And that is all about hard rock and heck. So do you, do you like? Do you feel that the outlaws are actually kind of part of that family tree? Well, when I had joined um, the outlaws in '77, I they flew me from Los Angeles. Uh, I had met them the year previously, and they had flown me from Los Angeles. Uh, their management got in touch and said, uh, "Would you like to come in?" Uh, and jam with the guys. Well, I had no idea. They I go, sure, sure, get me out of here. Get me out of the studios. And uh, it was an exciting time, but I had no idea they had an outgoing member at that time. And uh, for whatever reason, but it, it was so quick. We rehearsed for uh, about seven days. They sent me a hit list of songs to learn and uh, <laughs> rehearse. And uh, nobody really said anything. Then we were on the plane. The first gig was Boston Gardens. And uh, uh, I've always had a, uh, a heavier hand musically. I've always loved, you know, the, uh, the harder, uh, harder edged energetic music. So I brought that to the band and it worked out pretty good. Uh, our first album uh, was Bring It Back Alive. That was my first album with them. And uh, is recorded in six different cities, uh, Miami, San Diego, so on and so forth. And uh, by then, we had become a rocking machine. <laughs> we switched our amplifiers, bigger amps, this and that. And uh, you can hear it on that record. That album went gold in about three weeks, that uh, Bring It Back Live album. And it pushed the first album gold, which still baffles me considering the success of green grass and high tides right. Uh, right. i thought that would be a triple platinum record but things slipped through the cracks uh, in the record industry at times it should have been a double platinum record considering the visibility of that song but uh, so the live one pushed the first one gold uh, and then we moved on from there it became a more you can see it on there in 81 uh, a much more aggressive unit uh, 
than oh. uh, than when they first started. But you brought you were like the third axe brought on board, yes. correct? Mm -hmm. So let me okay. So when you walked in in 1977, I, I love this because you walked into a band that had a really famous top 40 single, right from the first record, and then you're like the third axe attack. You're getting the gig, and you get to play this classic green grass and high tides like jam session. You just must have been like in heaven. It was uh, ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, keep in mind uh, the Outlaws never had a top forty hit until Ghost Riders, and um, that should have been a top ten hit. Uh, I think it got as high as thirty or something. That's what I'm saying about things slipping through the cracks, you know, uh, should have been huge. Plus we were touring uh, nonstop 300 days a year. Uh, even if we put out a bad album, we could still sell out headline in Madison Square Garden. It became a jam band of sorts uh, uh, with a following like the dead has. I was gonna say that. Uh, fish. I mean, those bands have never sold any albums whatsoever. I, I, the first uh, first dead hit was, <laughs> I think, uh, Touch of Grey, uh, you know. It was, uh, it was. Years and MTV. years later. What's that? Because of the video on MTV, because uh, that, that skeletal yeah. video, right? Love that yeah. song and love the video. Great tune, too. Wonderful song, Jerry. And uh, But uh, uh, so we became that kind of band. and. Even if we had a bummer album and we had a couple that just didn't sell through three, four hundred thousand, uh, we were used to gold albums. And uh, uh, but it didn't matter. The people still came uh, two nights at the Spectrum in Philadelphia, New Haven Coliseum over here, Queen Elizabeth Theater in Toronto over here, back and forth. It just didn't matter. And we just jammed. It was a, it was a jam band. And that was our crowd. It was a rabid crowd of uh, people. They were just absolutely. Uh, but it, uh, we worked with the dead a couple times, and uh, uh, the continuity uh, was uh, pretty close. Um, pretty close. When you're working with the dead, there's not really a lot of crowd response, but you can tell they're uh, <laughs> they're they're digging it by what they're doing in the crowd. <laughs> Uh, you can smell it <laughs> yeah with that and uh yeah and who knows what else yeah 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 a lot of pills i'm sure but uh uh anyways uh but that's what the outlaws became a super jam band so who was the one that came to the table and said ever heard of this guy called stan jones um maybe we should actually like do a cover of this song because I was when I was doing my research, like the greatest Western song ever, like that's a pretty high accolade. Well, you know, it's a good question. By the time we had recorded that, that song had been recorded 17 times already. Right. Uh, Johnny Cash, Roy Clark, the Sons of the Pioneers. <laughs> Uh, this and that, oh, just, uh, abs I, I mean, I recently, by now it's probably 30 or 40 times, uh, I just heard like a, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, a metal core band do the song, they redid it, and it's the Outlaws version, uh, it's the version, and then there was a, another gentleman uh, who came from the 80s uh, Los Angeles hair metal, uh, uh, Ron Keel, Ron Keel, yes, he okay. did a he did a version. So uh, besides all of the, oh, the Highwaymen did a version as well with Willie and, uh, yeah. and uh, you know, Johnny Cash and uh, Chris Chris Robertson. Yeah. Uh, so it had been done 17 times. It was written by Stan Jones and it was actually the lead song on a Disney film, Ghost Riders in the Sky, which was, listen, in the, 40s or early 50s when he recorded that don't ask me how he came up with it in those days he he probably took something real good and uh had some good visions but uh uh but stan jones wrote it von monroe made it a huge secular hit 
and it went on from there and uh, we recorded it. Huey, we were in the studio in Los Angeles at the record plant and Huey and our producer, Ron Nevison, Huey told Ron, we're looking for that one tune, that one tune, which you always are, uh, whether it's FM or crossover or whatever. And uh, Huey said, why don't we do Ghost Riders? And that's how it happened. And Ron was, uh, uh, till this day, I still stay in touch with him. A wonderful, wonderful hard rock producer. Uh, and uh, from the Zeppelin to The Who to uh, Strangers in the Night, UFOs. I still listen to that, that record. Uh, but uh, a wonder, wonderful producer with vision and uh, music, 3D musical vision. And uh, we put it together, took a oh. sort of uh, overdub. Six days it took us, but it came out. We did it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you just cut out there for a moment. So we're all good. We're all good. Uh, oh, did I cut out? Yeah, it's, it's 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 this wonderful thing called the internet. So we're all good. We're all good. What part did you miss? Um, just before the six days of cutting that song with Ron. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, Huey, Huey is the one. I don't know if uh, I can reiterate that. Huey and Ron basically came up with the idea. We went in Studio C, which is the large room. We were there for off and on six months doing that record. And uh, it took us six days just to get the bed track of it. But we knew we had it right then and we knew it was gonna be a big song. So that's how it happened. And, and just to reiterate as well, like you brought, like there was a, like a certain amount, like why did the outlaws need to get heavier? Like where was that inspiration from? To get heavier because because that's where really hard rock and heavy metal really started to get heavier well you know i saw it as they had a good foundation when i had joined they had done three albums and the first one of course uh with green grass on it was the biggest one the second one um i did okay i think lady in waiting and then the third one, Hurry Sundown, did pretty good too. But I kind of felt, uh, since I'd been working the studios for years, I worked with a lot of producers. Believe me, I took in a lot of, uh, a lot of knowledge uh, while working the studios uh, in Los Angeles and elsewhere. And I said, you know, it might be time here. Uh, because our first gig before anything happened, I could feel that that's where the band wanted to go. And Huey and Billy were, oh, I mean, they were aggressive players. I said, why don't we ramp this up a little bit so that we're able to project from a stadium stage or a Coliseum or whatever. I mean, and, uh, and possibly fit, you know, further the career, it seemed as though like the country rock thing at that time was waning a bit, okay? And that's why probably the uh, next two albums didn't really sell through that well. And Hurry Sundown was a magnificent record. I don't know, maybe 300,000 units. Uh, uh, so uh, here again, uh, things slipped through the cracks in the business with whatever record company management but uh we needed to ramp it up we needed to become a hard-edged southern rock band and uh and that's what we did uh the amplifiers changed uh huey loved hendrix billy's playing was so forceful and precise uh so they said yeah let's do this let's Let's push the envelope a bit and, you know, see what happens. But uh, they had a good base. They had a very good base to build upon. So it worked out. It worked out well. We just kept getting a little heavier, a little heavier, a little heavier. We worked some huge stadium shows with the Stones and under 10,000 people a day. And 
you got to project from those stages, you know. You got to project to the guy very, 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 way, way in the back of the top bleacher of uh, those stadiums. And that's what we did. Uh, uh, two days there at Anaheim, uh, one day at a JFK Stadium where we were headlining the roundup that was called 110,000 people. Uh, we nailed it, nailed it to the wall. It was an exciting time. Can we step backwards because your history really floors me um, when you were a young kid joining the Chambers Brothers. Uh, like, what, like what kind of family support did you have when you were a teenager and you had to tell dad or mom, I'm like, I'm going to go play guitar with these guys. Well, by then I had left home. I was born in a beautiful little town in the Midwest known as the rubber capital of the world, and that was Akron, Ohio. Okay. <laughs> Have you ever heard of Akron, Ohio? Uh, absolutely. I've been there, yes. You've been there? Yes, yes. Well, it's not that far from me, so. No kidding. Well, that's where I was born and raised. Okay. And after my high school graduation, I took my $500, and I took uh, my, a guitar, my Les Paul guitar, which I still have, and I went to Los Angeles. And were my parents pleased? No, <laughs> probably not. Uh, probably, uh, but they, they were smart enough to know that, uh, let him get, a, you know, if he doesn't get it out of his system, he'll never, uh, he'll continue. So uh, I went and it was a, a bittersweet parting from my folks. Uh, and my dad, he was a, uh, he, uh, he owned, several different working men bars around the rubber companies okay. shot in beer places so to say yeah and um uh so of course they were sad to see me go uh but uh went to los angeles and got started and uh well i gotta tell you uh i had one can of uh tuna and one can of van de camp's pork and beans in my cupboard i lived on 10th and vermont Okay, um, close to downtown LA. I took the bus everywhere. I'd take my guitar and go up to the Sunset Strip a few few days, a few nights a week and uh, jam. I'd play and I'd meet people. But I was just about ready to pack it in and I saw a, an audition listing in, uh, I think it was uh, Ver, uh, Variety. I think it was Variety where I saw it and it was, open audition for this group uh, the Chambers Brothers and I said I gotta go grab this took the bus up to SIR on Sunset and uh, there was 50 people in line and I said I gotta grab this I gotta grab this one and I got the gig can you believe it wow and that started my uh, career in music I toured with them for two years or so and did it one album with them. And uh, uh, we had moved back to New York at that point. They had a uh, home in uh, Connecticut, Stamford, Connecticut. So we all moved there. So I left LA and uh, uh, it was a, a learning experience for me. It, th that was my college, because I did not go to college. You know, um, that was my college. and. Uh, in the band were, were some tremendous players. Uh, uh, one, uh, one who you know his name, uh, we're young kids, but his name's Steve Hunter. Yeah. Do you know that name? I think I do know that name. Is there an Alice Cooper? Um... <laughs> yes. yes, Deacon yeah. Hunter. And he was also, also on, uh, his breakout was when he was on Lou Reed's Rock and Roll Animal. Okay. okay. That album which was recorded live at the Academy of Music in New York. And then he went on to Peter Gabriel. He went on to Alice. He went on to this. He went on to that. I uh, became quite a, an iconic backing musician and session player. Wonderful. Played on uh, Aerosmith albums and this and that. He was a bit older than I. I was 18, 19. He was 24, 23, 24. And, uh, but I learned a lot from him and, uh, the drummer was Jerome Braley, who went on with uh, Parliament Funkadelic. Uh, we j it was a great time and a, a great learning experience. 
but like your resume is is astounding and like the whole like the Barbara Streisand thing just blows me away <laughs> there's got to be a ton of stories there so that's part one so maybe we'll start with part one <laughs> well I'm telling you I hate to be a, a downer here but um those sessions in the 70s, the early 70s, and throughout, half the time you didn't know what you were playing on. Right. You were a working union session guy, and you really didn't know. And you were too young to, you know, let's do this so I can get out of here. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, that one was a peculiar little uh, deal because, uh, I was at the studio and the producer, I wasn't, I wasn't scheduled for the date. And the producer grabbed me out of the hallway and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm on break right now, but I'm over here in Studio C. I was working on something I can't remember. But uh, he says, come in here now. Hands me acoustic guitar and the chord sheet and... I was in there about 30 minutes and did it. And uh, there was no one else in there except him and I. Okay. And, um, uh, and uh, later on, I found out. I had no idea until allmusic.com posted it. And uh, I got a union voucher for it. I was paid. Uh, and, uh, but uh, most of those, uh, so many people have asked me, that, oh, you worked with this person and that person. Where They're rarely there. Those big stars are rarely there. They come in when everything is completely done and right. they can come in with the producer and sing. And so, uh, so it, it's rather, uh, you know, uh, not as exciting as it may seem. Not as exciting as The, the Wrecking Crew. You, you, I'm sure you saw that documentary. Yes, yes. Well, that that was the real exciting time uh, in in the Los Angeles recording uh, market because they were creative musicians and they would come in, they would create the vibe for the artist, so on and so forth. And um, uh, from the late fifties to the early seven by by the early seventies, they had much, it was pretty much over for them except for a couple of the guys, Tommy Tedesco and Hal Blaine, he was still active. Carol Kay was still active, but uh, the, the Wrecking Crew as a group seemed to dissipate uh, because all the musicians started playing, all the artists started playing their own music, <laughs> their own instruments. And, uh, but that was the real, real exciting time uh, there. Um, I sometimes wish I'd lived in that era, but by now I'd be 140, so uh, <laughs> so it wouldn't have worked out too good. But that was an exciting, exciting time uh, there, uh, and my time became a little mundane. You go in and you do this and do that, and uh, uh, here's your chart, mostly chord charts and not much coloration, and um, uh, you do your gig, you know, and that's how you live. Uh, but it was an exciting time in LA. Studios were just ugh, were just piling over with uh, you know with musicians and recording projects, piling over from a film to audio to both, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, very exciting time that, at that time. So it was always something uh, to go good to go back to in Los Angeles. So what inspires you today to create? Well, I still, you know, I still have a certain amount of uh, sessions and production projects that I do, but, but not day to day, just select something I really, really like uh, or something I feel motivated to do. Uh, but I've been working on, uh, I've always been a fan of newer, newer, new. I've always kept up on new, new artists, new artists, new this, new that, new this. And I rarely go back. I'll go back to the classics sometimes like Hendrix or Robin Trower or Santana, but I'm always trying to surge ahead 
and stay up with the times as far as, uh, and it's become an interesting thing since radio has, uh, secular radio, that is, secular radio has become non-existent for me, but the indie market and what you do, you guys do, and so on and so forth, I'm pretty aware of a lot of great uh, new artists, but I've been working on my album for the past two and a half years. And uh, it's called Freddie Salem and Lone Wolf, Black Cloud Rising. And it's a really heavy handed conceptual Americana record. Okay. And I've taken my time with it because I don't, I don't want, like a classic rock artist, I don't want to put an album out and call the record label and go, well, how are we doing? Well, Freddie had sold 310 units. <laughs> in six months time <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, I mean I'm you know I've been associated with selling gold albums and uh, and platinum albums I uh, I want to go out when I do with the blaze of glory you know what I'm saying yes absolutely well these days I'm all about partnerships and it's it's desperate times for a lot of people and um, I've had success with that this year so Maybe there's more we can talk about. No, you're doing magnificently, magnificently. Have you ever interviewed Tim Ripper Owens? Yes, a few times. People think that I look like him. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, you look well. You look across between him and Rob Halford. Yes, yes. Interviewed uh, <laughs> many times. <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, Timmy's. Uh, I knew him when he was like 15, 16 years old artist from Akron, Ohio, wonderful kid. And uh, I took the, his band years ago into the studio. I think he was 16. I knew he was going to be something, and he sure did. But Akron is such a, a vibrant music scene. So many people come from there, you know. Uh, it started happening when I left. So I go, what am I doing here? <laughs> it's a, You got Warner Brothers jets flying into Akron every two days, and I'm in L.A. <laughs> and, and you're waving at them, so. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So anyways, that's it. Uh, but, uh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I appreciate that comment. We will stay in touch and we're going to blow this up. This is going to be wonderful. Thank you so much for all the history, all the stories, all the passion. I can feel it in your voice. So, Oh, thanks brother. I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, folks uh, go buy the, the DVD CD package. It's wonderful. It's uh, everywhere on Amazon and wherever else. And uh, it's top 10 in Europe on Amazon. Yeah. Doesn't it's surprise. Nice. Do you have a package? It's, a CD and a DVD. So yeah, it's a it's nice pathway. It's on the way. Everyone just needs to be an outlaw. How cool is that, right? I know, brother. That's I know. I appreciate it again. Thank you so much. All right. Nice to talk to you, okay? Be safe. Okay, brother. Yeah, we'll talk soon.